Well, good morning. Welcome to the church at Avenue South. I hate to interrupt the conversations, but we're going to worship together if that's all right. So let's join this group here and stand together. We're going to sing some songs. <laughs>
Amen. You guys can have a quick seat. Thank you. Well, good morning, Church at Avenue South. Uh, let me add my word of welcome to Ronnie and the rest of his team and just tell you how grateful we are that you chose to worship with us this morning. I want to take the next several minutes, I want to ask you to get comfortable, and I want to encourage you to continue worshiping through the giving of your tithes and your offerings. We see in the Old Testament that a tithe is 10%, and it's 10% of everything that we own. Then if you see in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Acts, the mark, the characteristic of a healthy church is generosity. We see that the church in Antioch gave generously and each one according to their ability. And it's our hope that we are a healthy New Testament ch church. One not only marked by their love for people and the gospel, but their generosity. And so there are several ways that you can give here at the Church at Avenue South. You can give online. You can text the word GIVE to 623-623. And for the first time in 16 months, we'll be passing these things, offering baskets. And so you can place your offering in the basket. And so as I invite our ushers to come forward, I want you to pray and ask the Lord, what is it you would have me to give? When we think about giving, we think about being generous with our time, our talents, and our treasures. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I, I'm grateful for your sacrifice on the cross. And we see that you model generosity because you gave it all so that we could have eternal life. God, it's my hope that when you look at the church at Avenue South, you see a New Testament church. Yes, a church that is passionate about sending men and women to demonstrate and proclaim the gospel locally, nationally, and globally. A church that is passionate about preaching the word but also, Lord, a church that is generous with their time, their talents, and their treasures. So we pray that you would receive these tithes and offerings, Lord, and that they will be used to have a kingdom impact. In your name I pray. Amen. I want to invite uh, a couple to join me on stage this morning. This is Mark and Tricia Faulkner. I got to know Mark and Tricia about four years ago when they asked me to officiate their wedding. Uh, I've had the pleasure of traveling with Mark and Tricia to Guatemala uh, two of the last three years. And so I've asked Mark and Tricia to be here this morning to share with us a little about their experience in Guatemala. So Mark and Tricia, thanks for being here. One of the things that Aaron and I discuss quite frequently is this, is that it's our hope that everyone in this congregation, whether you're here this morning or you're watching online, is that you go on a global mission journey. Why? Well, if you go on a mission journey, it really changes the lens in which you view humanity relationships, your job, your career. It gives you perspective. And so, Mark, here's what I want to ask you, and Tricia, would you share with us this morning why Guatemala? Why you were part of the mission journey and why missions? Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Thanks for having us here today. You know, I think for us, um, we started coming to the church uh, probably five years ago. And for the first couple of years, we came every Sunday, we heard the messages, um, and about two years ago, uh, Trish and I were having a conversation just about how fortunate we are in our lives, what God has done in our lives, um, how fortunate we are to live in this country. And we asked ourselves, what are we doing with what we heard? Um, how are we responding to what we hear every, every week? Um, and we started talking to Matthew about going to Guatemala. And for us, Guatemala was a um, kind of an easy trip. It's, it's easy to get to. Um, it's not overly burdensome, um, but it was a good way for us to kind of step out and try something that we haven't done before. Um, so, it, you know, for us, it was a chance to um, just kind of respond and give back um, in a way that um, we thought was going to be r really appropriate and to put to practice the things that we hear every week. Yeah, Mark, one of the things you said in the first service that I loved, you said, you're not an evangelist, but I went anyway. So for those people out here who don't have that spiritual gift, right, Sorry. why should they go or what could they do when they're on the ground? Yeah, Matthew, I, I, I am not an evangelist. That is not my <laughs> gift. Um, I have the gift of administration. Um, and really, for me, it, it's a chance to go um, make sure that those people that do have that gift um, 
making sure they have the resources that they need, making sure that they've got the environment that they need to be able to have those conversations with the women, the men, and the children um, in Guatemala, um, and to help in any way that we can, just to show up and be a positive um, example, a positive influence on the people of Guatemala. Yeah, one of my favorite memories of you, Mark, was we were walking to a home that we had put a roof on and we were pouring concrete floor. And we had a bag of cement, a bag of sand, and a bag of gravel. And you had a shovel in your hand. And I don't know if you remember, but you said, how are we going to mix concrete? And I said, I'm looking at him. And for the next 45 minutes, you had that shovel in your hand and you were just working. And that's being the hands and feet of Jesus. And so even though you may not have that spiritual gift of evangelism, you can go and you can be the hands and feet of Jesus and help people understand and know that they're created in the image of God with value and worth. Absolutely. Last question for you guys. What is, uh, we experienced a lot mm -hmm. as a team. What's one thing that stood out in your mind that you've taken back here that you said, I'm going to really incorporate this into my everyday life? I'm going to give you two things for me, and I'll give Trisha one, because okay. your story about the house uh, just reminded me of one that was really important, just the gratefulness that we saw um, in the family to have a house to live in, shelter and roof over their head. Um, that was just really meaningful for all the hard work that we put in. I think the other one was in our conversation with Fernando. So Fernando helped run the camp, uh, the camp there at Camp Calvary. In a conversation with him, we were just kind of talking about the community and the culture of Guatemala. And one of the things that really struck me was the fact that he said that 50% of the women in that community um, suffer some form of domestic abuse. And the children, right, the little kids there, they also are a party to that. Either they see it or they're a part of the abuse themselves. And as I heard that conversation, and you kind of think about, like, what can you do in a week in a country where that's the culture? And they have this very um, machismo culture. Um, it, it really struck to me that really what we're trying to do there is just plant these little seeds in people's hearts and minds because that's really where this all starts is giving them hope, giving them um, a little bit of, of, of uh, faith in the word that we can change people from the inside and hopefully start to change you know, each individual house, which changes the community, which then changes the country. Yeah. And that's really what we were there to, yeah. to do. One of the things that changed... Uh, me a lot uh, one of the stories that happened in Guatemala is I serve as a pharmacist on mission trips even though I'm not actively a pharmacist um, in the U.S. right now but um, <clears throat> what would some of the other people who are doing vacation Bible school don't get to see is the children who are still 12 and 13 years old coming in with problems that only maybe a 26 year old woman should be dealing with mm -hmm. so it's very heart-wrenching to see the abuse in these children and um, one girl really stared at me one day as I was getting prescriptions ready and I asked the translator to come over and I looked at her and I said, you can, you can do this, you can overcome, and you can be a successful woman. And I think, I don't know if that planted a seed, but for some reason I felt like it really did plant a seed. Uh, being being um, on a mission trip, just to give you all a sense, is it, it will give you a healthy sense of who you are and where you are in your life. And as Ronnie has played the song so appropriately, I, you have everything I need. God has everything we need. Um, and going on a mission trip will, will surely enhance how you see yourself as a human being. Uh, good word, Tricia. Church, here's what I'm asking you to do this morning. Over the next 12 months... I want you to begin to pray, where is God asking you to go? Where is he sending you? As countries begin to open up and some of the restrictions are rolled back, we're sending a team back to Guatemala December 27th through January the 2nd. December 27th through January the 2nd. Maybe the Lord says, you need to be on that journey, but I want you to begin to pray is how and where is the Lord sending me? And I want you to know, we talk about giving a lot. But your giving is a part of the story. Why? When you give, a portion of that giving helps to scholarship every church member that goes on International Mission Journey. Every church member goes at a discounted rate of 10%, and that's because of your generosity and your faithfulness to give. So that's how you're taking part in this mission. Again, I want to challenge you this morning just to begin to pray, Lord, where is it? You would have me to go in 2021 and 2022. Let me pray for you. 
Jesus, I'm thankful for this couple, their obedience. As Mark mentioned, yeah, in, in so many ways, Guatemala is easy. It's the same time zone. It's a three-hour flight. But in many other ways, it will stretch you and challenge you and push you outside of your comfort zone. God, we worked hard for those six days, scattering seed. Lord, may we keep in mind that we are not responsible for where the seed lands, the condition of that person's heart but we are responsible to scatter the seed and be faithful to the mission. May we be a church, Jesus, that is faithful to that mission. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, guys. You guys stand with us. Let's sing.
continue worshiping with a song we started learning a couple weeks ago. We'll continue to learn it together as Hannah leads us.
guys can have a seat real quick. Well, good morning, church family. Uh, I want to introduce this young lady. This is Lauren Shell, and Lauren is joined this morning by her parents, uh, Bob and Tara, and one of her best friends, Bree. And they're standing here because they're an integral part of her spiritual formation, her discipleship. And if you're here to celebrate Lauren this morning, could you just lift your hand? Awesome. What a beautiful picture of God's grace. Um, Lauren, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this this morning. I started meeting with Lauren several weeks ago, and she indicated to me, she said, Matthew, she said, I'm ready to follow in believer's baptism. And I said, well, what is it you would want our people to know about who you are and how Jesus has transformed your life? And here's what she said. She said, I was fortunate. I was born and raised in a Christian home. My mom and dad introduced me to the gospel at a young age, and I professed Jesus as a child. But it really wasn't until I was in my early 20s that it began to take root in my life. I had just finished college and have permission from Lauren to share this part of her story. And she said, Matthew, I was struggling with depression, anxiety. I was just really lost. I didn't know what was next for me. I was stressed out and overwhelmed about just the challenges of this world. And it was then that my aunt and my uncle, who attend the Brentwood campus, invited her to come to church. They challenged her really to start to lean in to the Lord. And she began to read about who Jesus was, his actions, his personalities, his deeds, his Christology we see in the Gospels. And it was then that you told me that the Lord really began to reveal himself to you. And he began to cling to. And I love the word that you used. You said, it was him who gave me relief, gave me hope, and brought me the joy that I needed Lauren, is that your story, that you have professed Jesus Christ to be your Savior and your Lord? Well, I'm excited for you this morning because, as I mentioned, I, I get to be a part of this. So upon your profession of faith, I want to baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen. Hey, before we hear from the word, we're going to stand together. We're going to sing. You guys stand with us. We're going to sing just a little bit more before. Let's sing this bridge. Nothing compared. Comes close. No. Comes close to the Lord. Such an awesome God. Such an awesome God. So mighty. So holy. So wonderful. Such an awesome God. So selfless. So generous. so thankful for that truth. You are an awesome God. God. We need you, we love you, and we thank you for who you are. God, continue to move in this place. God, continue to draw us closer to you as we hear from your word and as Aaron comes to teach. God, because we need you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Have a seat.
Church family, we want to continue worshiping. We have sung songs. We have celebrated baptism. There are many things we've done since we've gathered here in this room for corporate worship, but we're going to continue worshiping by reading God's Word together. That's one of the things the church in the book of Acts did as a way to tune their hearts to the voice of the Lord. So we want to do that corporately. If you have a Bible, let me encourage you to join me in the book of Amos. If you've been with us the last two weeks, you know that we are walking through in a four-week series the words of the prophet Amos, who arrived in the northern kingdom of Israel to announce God's message to them. And while you're turning there, let me share with you, um, I, uh, several months ago, was in line at a drive through window, and I was waiting in line, and when I got up to the window... Um, they gave me my meal, and I took out my wallet, and I was going to pay, and they said, sir, it's already been taken care of. They said, someone's already paid for it. I don't know if you've experienced that. Someone paid it forward. Somebody previously in the line said, I want to pay for the car behind me. I thought, why didn't I order, like, tons of food today? Um, but the, the first kind of phrase out of my mouth to the person at the window was like, I must be living right. And, and I don't know if you've ever felt that way. You're like, something must be going right to receive this kind of favor. And I said it in jest, and it's kind of a little bit of a, of a cliche, if you will, that we say in the South, like, I must be living right. The sun's out, the weather's good, free meal. And the reality is, you know, if you've experienced that, for many of us, we work hard. Uh, we, we try to be effective and successful with our careers, our relationships, whatever we put our hands to. Um, and so there's a lot of hard work represented in this congregation. There's a lot of intentionality, a lot of intelligence represented Um, But one of the things that we've seen in this book, and we're going to see today, is God's people assumed that their wealth and prosperity, which it was a great time for those things. This is about 800 years before the arrival of Christ. But God's people, we can learn from them. It's so contemporary to 2021. They were in a time of great economic wealth and prosperity, and they assumed we must be living right This must be something we've earned or we've done. And the reality was it wasn't anything they had done. The favor they were experiencing had been based on the character of God and his goodness to his people. And so they were excited. The the Old Testament uses a phrase called the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. The arrival of God as the Messiah. The day of the Lord. And they were really fired up about the day of the Lord because we must be living right. We can't wait for God to reveal himself in a way that we'll never forget. Now, I want you to look with me in Amos chapter 5. I want to read with you verses 18 through 20 together. Just remain seated because we're going to walk through this text together and we're going to go through the chapter together. But this is what the prophet Amos said. You're excited. You're feeling like you must be living right. You can't wait for the day of the Lord. Look at verse 18. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord, which, in case you're curious, is not an encouraging announcement. What will the day of the Lord be for you? It will be darkness and not light. It's not going to be like what you think. It will be like a man who flees from a lion, which I'm assuming is a good thing. Never had to face that myself. Only to have a bear confront him instead. That's not not good. He goes home and he rests his hand against the wall. Just wants to rest. Just wants to relax. Only to have a snake bite him. Never experienced that either, but that ain't good. Won't the day of the Lord be darkness rather than light, even gloom without any brightness in it? Now let me pause right there for just a moment and say, how do you get, this is a really good open-ended question for us to consider, how do you get from assuming you're God's people, things are good, we must be living right, we've got prosperity, we've got wealth, Things seem to be going well. How do you get from that point to being so wrong that God sends a messenger to say, you think it's based on your goodness? And I don't think you should be fired up about the Lord revealing himself because he's not really excited. It isn't going to go well for you. How, how do you get to that point? Let me share with you a brief story. Um, Several years ago, it was almost a decade ago, I don't know how I stumbled upon it, but I stumbled upon the 1956 movie Giant. 
don't know how many of you have seen the movie Giant from 1956. I think what drew me to it was it's got three incredibly powerful celebrities that were historic actors and actresses at the time. It's got James Dean in it. It was the last movie James Dean made before he was tragically killed in, in an automobile accident. So that drew me to it. Like, yeah, I mean, everybody talks about it. this was his final work. I want to see it. And it had Rock Hudson in it. It had Liz Taylor in it, and the way those characters interact and play off one another. I was like, I just want to watch this movie. And the reality of it is it's set in West Texas in the early 1900s, around 1930s or 40s then, I guess I could say. And the, the big story is really Rock Hudson has a farm, and he has livestock, and he's very wealthy based on all that he owns. And so it's a story about old money and someone who's wealthy based on livestock. Well, here's James Dean, and James Dean is a ranch hand. He lives there, and he ultimately discovers oil buried under that ranch. And when he strikes it rich with that crude oil, he sells it by the barrel and hundreds and thousands of barrels, and he becomes incredibly wealthy, and it bothers Rock Hudson that his wealth is far outpacing James Dean's wealth, is far outpacing his own. And so there is in the middle of this a frustration and a jealousy and a rivalry, and Liz Taylor's caught in the middle of it. And there's an iconic image of this movie, and I have a picture of it in my home. I want to put this on the screen here for you, but it's of James Dean reclining in an open canopied vehicle with the big house that Rock Hudson owns in the back. And it's, it's James Dean dreaming about, like, I want that house. Like, one of these days, I'm going to have my own little piece of the world. And, and when I saw this, I can remember thinking at the movie, like, I want to go visit the set. Like, I want to go to this place in West Texas. And I think I want to buy the cowboy hat, I want to buy the boots, want to do the tourism thing. Like, everybody who comes to Nashville buys those things. And we don't wear them here, but you'll see tourists wear them. Um, we... We do that. I want to do that. I want to live it out. And like, I cannot wait to see this house because every time they'd open it up, they'd host huge parties. And it was a mansion and almost spiral staircase. I'm like, I, just, I want to go in that house. So I did like most of us do. We get on the interwebs. We search a little bit. Like, what was it like? And did you know, like, I found out it's a total and complete sham. It's a total and complete sham. This house is just a facade. It's built out in West Texas. There are about six telephone poles behind it with big old pieces of board strapped to it and painted to look like a house. It ain't really even 3D. It's 2D almost. There's tons of form to it, but there's no substance. And that absolutely crushed me. I mean, it was like so disheartening. I was like, what a great movie, but it's all a sham. It's fake. And listen, I... I won't walk through all of our favorite movies because it'll steal the joy we have about them because in Hollywood, if you go visit, right, for Amy, it was when she went to see the Leave it to Beaver set as a kid and she wanted to go meet Wally and the Beaver and her dad was like, like, there's no one in there. You can open the door and you walk through to the other side of the studio. Like, oh, it's a sham. It, there's plenty of form here, but there's no substance to it. How do you get from where you, you are in relationship with God, you are his people, and you get hundreds of years later into the promised land, they've been there a couple hundred years, and, and you think like all the favor and all of the prosperity is what, look, look at what we've built, and so he's blessing us because of, of our hard work. And, and how do you get to that point where the Lord shows up and says, it ain't like that at all. You have wrongly evaluated your effectiveness. And matter of fact, like we saw last week, how do, how do you get to where you're so far off course in relationship with God? We saw last week, it, it's a slippery slope. Nobody wakes up and says, today I will be super sinful. Today I will be evil or unjust. Nobody says, today I will say, look at what all I've built. And God, who are you? Like nobody gets there in one step. It's multiple steps on a slippery slope. And last week we saw you, it begins with forgetting about who God is and what he's done for you and the little things in life. I challenged the congregation last Sunday to go home Journal, write, talk to friends, talk to family about how God's been faithful to you. Stack some stones as a memorial like so that you won't forget, so that you won't accidentally look up two years, ten years down the road and you veered off course. One of the things that people of God were doing is they had plenty of form in their worship. They sung songs. They brought their tithes and their offerings into the storehouse. They even went into church every Sunday morning. Yet there was plenty of form, but Amos says it's all a sham. It's a facade. You worship me with religion, but your hearts are so far from me. Now, that's just not my opinion. Keep reading. Look at what it says in verse 21. Read with me. I hate, I despise your feast. I can't stand the stench 
That is like so not a compliment. You guys smell. When you get together, your solemn gatherings, you think they're worshipful to me. I can't stand the smell of them. And that, that's like hard to hear. That's like, whoa, coming in hot, Lord. Like, wow. Even if you offer me your burnt offerings in verse 22 and your grain offerings, that means like you've, you've been bringing your tithe in. We, we did that just a moment ago. We were, like you, you're going through the rhythms. And even if you kept doing it, I don't want it. I don't want it. You know why? I won't accept it and I have no regard for it. Take away from me, verse 23. This one, like, this one offended me this week. I was like, oh my gosh, look at what he's saying. Verse 23, take away from me the noise of your songs. Now look, I sit on the front row so that you can't hear me singing over your shoulders because I know what I sound like, okay? But some of y'all sound beautiful and every time we learn a new song and Ronnie encourages you to, to, to sing a new song and you sing it and sometimes he'll 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 mute all the other instruments, but maybe his guitar, and you sound beautiful, and your voices are getting stronger. Keep doing that. But, but even that, even them doing that, he says, like, it's, uh, it's disgusting to me. So, so as I'm reading this, I'm like, why, why is he so bothered by their worship? And he says, I don't even want to listen to the music that comes out of your instruments. See, here's the deal. Let's pick up that metaphor again. They had plenty of religious form. Checked all the boxes. Went to church on Sundays. But there was little to no substance. And look, this does not go well. About 40 years after Amos shows up, the Lord allows an invading Assyrian army to conquer, plunder, nearly destroy them completely and haul them off into slavery and captivity. One of the things that I ask myself is, how do you get to that point where you have evaluated, like you think it's checking the boxes, you think it's punching the list, you think it's going through all the rhythms and routines, religion. Like, we're not religious people. I don't want you to be a religious person. I want us to be spiritual people that keep in step with God's Holy Spirit. They were religious, had plenty of form, but there was no substance. And the Lord says, I don't want that. It's not what I'm after. God's not pleased when our worship is full of form, but has little to no substance. It's a matter of fact, it's offensive to him. And how do we know that their worship had, had plenty of form, but little substance? It's because the Lord says, you're close to me. You even gather near the worship platform in the temple, like you gather together in the tabernacle, but like your hearts are far from me. If you really loved me and you gave me your hearts and your devotion the same way you go through the, the check marks, you'd be different people. You would be transformed from the inside out. I mean, don't we love stories where characters are transformed? Like, I'm usually, when I watch a movie or binge watch something on Netflix, like, I, I'm looking for, like, transformation of characters. If somebody don't change, if something doesn't happen, I'm like, this dude just don't, like, I'm tired of watching this guy that won't change. This, this woman who just refuses to become a better version of herself or whatever. Like, I'm always looking for that. God says, if you love me with all your heart, you would be transformed from the inside out. So yes, you worship on Sunday. That is important. They did need to do that. This is where we come together and remember, like we talked about last week, there's only one God and it ain't me. <laughs> I, need to, I need to keep that in priorities. But it's also a place where we then are not only worshiping and loving the Lord with our heart and hear when we're gathered for an hour, but the other 167 hours of the week, our lives are transformed there as well. Now, we keep this sign 1 over 168 on the wall to your right, my left. If you're joining us online, let me throw this up on the screen. 1 over 168. I wrote in my journal in 2009, we planted this church in 2014, I, I would, Lord, I'd be so grateful if you allow me to pastor a church that gathered together in a space that was just big enough on Sunday morning for the people of God to gather, to worship you, to love you, to serve you, to hold up and value what's important, making disciples, sharing the gospel, going to the ends of the nation, to share the good news of Jesus with others. But then we scattered into the community where the other 167 hours of the week, there's 168 in a week, we lived out in the same way that we say we do on Sunday, the other six days of the week. And I wrote my journal, I would be grieved, Lord, if we had great services, and they stirred our hearts, and it was, worship was awesome, and nothing changed about the body. That would grieve me. Like, I would consider myself a failure as a pastor. I would say we are off target if that's what we turned into. So we've tried to keep our eyes and our, eye and our, and our target 
clearly ahead of us, that we want to be the same people outside of this room. Now, how do we know? Like, what were the indicators that, like, you, you go through the rhythms and the routines, but you don't really love me? It's because he said you would be transformed from the inside out. You'd look like different people. And four weeks ago, we went through Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, this is applicable for us in 2021, God said, for anybody who places faith in my son, anyone who enters into relationship with me, I promise you, I've already predetermined before I established the foundations of the heaven and the earth in creation, I will help you, I will work on your behalf to shape and conform you to look like my son Jesus. Why does he want that for us? Jesus and the Father are in perfect relationship. Jesus has unlimited peace. He has unlimited joy. He is flourishing as if we were looking for somebody like, who's, who's got a flourishing life? Who's got a successful life? Like, Jesus is the goal. He's the model. And so the Father says, I want you to have what my son has. So I will help you become like him. That's the goal. And these people were not doing that. And, and it was exhibited, and he said this, like, Throughout the book of Amos, he says, like, you've been liberated from slavery in Egypt. But here we are 200 years later, and you enslave people that, that can't pay their taxes. Are these the same people? Like, those of you that are wealthy, and we think, if I just had more money, I could be more generous. Usually more of something doesn't make us more generous. It makes us more greedy. At least that's how the flesh operates, in my humble opinion. And he says, you got more money than you've ever had in your lives. And you make it hard on poor people to get justice in the court system. You're unjust. And that's why he said, verse 24, I, I, I don't want form with no substance. So I tell you what, let justice flow like water and righteousness flow like an unfailing stream. Now, if I asked you, have you ever read anything in Amos before? Most people in churches would say, no, not really. Because, I mean, nobody, I told you all this before, like, n nobody really walks out of a sermon, in my opinion, from Amos being like, whoo, that was awesome today. Like, the Lord's getting all up in our business. We don't really feel good about it, right? So most of us don't read the modern prophets. Most Christians in North America don't read the Old Testament much. However, one of the things that you may, like, as I read that, but let justice flow like water and righteousness like a constant stream or torrent, flood, you may realize you've heard that before. You've heard it before. I bet you've heard it before and you don't know where you heard it before. This verse was quoted by Dr. Martin Luther King at the, heights, at the height of the civil rights movement in his speech from the Lincoln Memorial. And what he was saying is, now listen, I have a picture in my office of a little black girl, I think it was in Birmingham, and she's holding up a sign. And her sign says, how can a man love God and hate his neighbor? And I saw that when Ronnie and I were at the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis several years ago. And I immediately was overwhelmed and started weeping. I said, Ronnie, she's not talking to the world. Because the world, in general, doesn't claim to love God. I said, this little girl's talking to the church. I said, in the 60s, which we weren't alive for, there were people who said, I love God, and they'd raise their hand on Sunday, and then they would mistreat people with black skin color. And, and people with black skin color couldn't vote at certain times in our history. They didn't have the rights that we had, and they were mistreated. They were abused. They were harassed. So what Dr. King did is he quoted Amos 5.24, and he said, what we're asking for is the church to behave like the church. And he's talking to the world, yes. God, I told you all this last week. We saw it in the first week. God is going to judge every human who's ever lived for the way they mistreat, oppress, harass, violate, abuse other image bearers of God. Everybody will answer for it. Nobody gets off the hook. And we want God to do that, right? Don't we want God to punish things that are unjust, right? We're like, I don't like this justice, dog. It don't feel good when the Lord's like, I'm going to punish you because you're not been just. Deep down inside, we want justice, I laid on my horn the other day when somebody cut me off. I had the, I had the green arrow. And I'm like, hey, like it's, it's red on your side. And I'm like, this is my justice button. Like, do right by me. Next time you lay on the horn, think justice. Like we want someone to know you've offended me. It needs to be made right. Right? So Dr. King was saying, um, we definitely need the church to behave this way, to do what's just. So, yes, the application here is I, I hate and despise your feast. The form is there, but there's no substance. 
What God desires, and this is true in 2021, is people who are born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, to act with pure hearts rather than just fulfilling religious obligations to appease him or to look the part. What God wants is you and me to administer justice when we see things that are unjust and to act with righteousness, which means we act with integrity to do what God desires. Remember, he said, come follow me. Be set apart like me so that when the world looks at the way you behave, they say, who is their God that treats people who are oppressed with dignity, that, that speaks up for the unborn, that, that steps into the gap and works to, to advocate for those with black skin color or different races in 2021 that are oppressed or mistreated because of where they were born. Like, that's what I want just as much as you going through the rhythm and the routine on Sunday morning. And Amos said, it ain't happening. And God's done with it. And he's about to bring judgment. Now, that's a hard truth. Amos 5.24 is so hard. Um, it, that's what it means. Dr. King said, like, we, we've got to live in a way where justice comes out of the church and righteousness, right living and advocating that for others happens consistently all 168 hours of the week. But what Dr. King didn't really dig into, and you can't, I mean, in, in, you can't in, in that sermon, like, uh, another aspect of it is this. This is Amos saying, I've been patient long enough, and so now I will unleash justice like an unending torrent of water on you because you wouldn't do what I asked. I shared with you last week that one of my favorite memories from my college years is when my grandmother and grandfather and I in their Lincoln Continental put 2,200 miles on that baby and we drove to Niagara Falls and back. And when we got to the falls, one of the things that was interesting was we, uh, on the Canadian side, there's a museum of the falls. You ever been there? There's a museum, and they have, like, vessels where people have tried to go over the falls and survive. Like, I'm dumb at times, but, like, I, that's, that's not wise, okay? And they had barrels from the 1800s. <laughs> you think I'm joking? They had wooden barrels. And so I talked to people out of the service that had been there and seen that, like, with doors cut into them. Where, where people got in and wanted to float over and be the first to get wealthy to survive. I survived the falls. Like, okay, whatever. Um, and here's what's interesting. They, they shared at the museum, most people survived the falls. It's a massive, violent drop with a heavy pounding at the bottom. Most people survived the falls. They said, unfortunately, more times out of not, the majority of people who tried that, the current is so powerful right there at the bottom, they got trapped underneath the back of the falls. And they died in their vessel. He said, the reason we know that is because you can see scratch marks, you can see other things where, like, they didn't die on impact. They couldn't get out of the way of an unending torrent of water. There's no escape in it. Listen, I want, I want to draw a parallel with the text. If you and I will not be the church God's called us to be, and there are great things going on, and when I was led to the book of Amos, I didn't have like one sin I was trying to address in our church. Like, the Lord just led us to Amos. I told Amy this week, I've had so much fun in the book of Ruth and Amos this year. Go figure, two Old Testament books, right? We were in Luke for five months. No offense, good physician Luke. Like, I, I love the Old Testament. So I'm not specific. If you're like, he's passively aggressive calling something out. I'm not. I'm not. But I will tell you this, and we need to hear this. If you and I will not be the church that God's called us to be, not just in gathering. This is so important. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, don't neglect what happens on Sunday morning. Come on back in. We need to be here. But if you and I will not be the church that God calls us to be, he will judge us. And he will punish us. And there's no escape for it. It'd be like being in a barrel trapped under Niagara Falls. I, I, I think some Christians in North America, and maybe you're in this room, you, you think, I tithe, I'm, I'm, I'm moral, I don't do any grievous sins, and, and I'm, I'm good. Listen, you and I will not escape his punishment if we fail to be transformed by the same person that we pledged our allegiance to, Jesus Christ, and become advocates of justice. Those of us who have experienced justice 
just as if we'd never sinned by the finished work on the cross, ought to be the first ones to be living and behaving like Jesus out in the streets. We have to be first reconciled to God before we can be reconciled to other image bearers. we got to get that right first, and then we go from there. Listen, we want God to be just, and he is a good God, but he will not tolerate disobedience. He will not tolerate sin. He will punish and deal with sin. And that's what he's doing here. Verse 27, so I will send you into exile beyond Damascus. I have a friend who was born in Damascus. Damascus is just at the northern part of Israel. And beyond that, in 760 B.C., was the Assyrians. They were evil. They were awful. They were violent. And the Lord allowed them, four decades after this came to be, to come into Israel and haul women and children and men off as if they were fish with hooks through their mouth. And many of them never made it to the Assyrian capital because they were abused, mistreated, and died on the march. Like, that's what happened. I, I'm done playing games, the Lord says. Be holy as I am holy. That's a really important, that's a healthy message for us to remember, right? Like, I, I think about um, how, how hard it is to process this. Like, that's, whoa, that's rough. When I was about six, my grandparents' house right outside of Chattanooga, uh, my cousin, I think she was around one at the time, um, she was playing with a set of keys. And she was wandering, crawling around the floor like, punching everything with keys, punching the couch, punching people's legs, punching the coffee table. Like, and I remember her going over to the electric outlet. And you could see where this is going. She's about to see if she could put the keys in the electric socket. And I remember my grandfather or some adult in the house going over there and being like, no, no, that's, that's not a good idea. And then I remember, like, in the weeks or months after, then there were like little, little sockets over the outlets, right? Like, stop, this will not go well for you. And, and then, like, I, I think it happened then, a, a punishment or a spanking for the repetitive, incessant desire, right? Like, when a parent tells you, don't do this as a teenager, what's the first thing you want to do? <laughs> oh, you shouldn't have said that. I so want to do this. That's our flesh. That's sin. And so, ultimately, if a parent spanked a child to, to arrest their attention to say, this is not my best for you, Matter of fact, it will destroy you. We wouldn't see that. You wouldn't see my grandfather. I was six years old, but I intuitively knew he's compelled by love to draw a line, right? The book of Amos is wrapped in the love of God for a people that he's been pleading with for hundreds of years. When we read a text like this, don't you make the mistake and don't you tell people that God is not just, that God is not patient, that he's not long-suffering. He pleaded with them for 200 years. And if you want to, when you read chapter 5 later today, read verse 4. Seek me and live. If you want to, read verse 6. Seek the Lord and live. If you want to, read verse 14. Pursue good and not evil. If you didn't hear me through the prophet Amos say twice after 200 years of sin and rebellion, hear me again say so that there's no misunderstanding about what I desire. Don't only not sin, but seek me with all of your heart. And when you do, you'll find me. And you and I will begin to build a life together where you'll be transformed from the inside out. And I will, by the power of the Spirit, give you joy and peace and kindness and love and patience and confidence and joy and hope. I'll give you all of those things that I have at my disposal. When you seek me, you'll live. That's the goal, folks. Like, we overcomplicate faith. Seek me and live. And I think the most, just the, the saddest part of Amos is the solution to their impending judgment was so simple and right in front of them yet they won't do the one thing that will save their lives. Stop. Repent. Seek me. Come back to me. I'm your first love. Over and over and over again. Hey, look, God doesn't just desire a mere change of actions or some good moral religious actions. He wants us to repent of our sin and ourself at the moment of salvation, but every day of our lives. We struggle with the flesh. What we want instead of what God wants. Listen, they, they went through the motions for God, but they were worshiping idols as well. I thought to myself, we, we're the same way. We worship sex. We worship sexuality. We worship money. We worship sports teams. Like, 
We worship artists. You with me? Totally applicable to 2021. He says, stop. They can't give you what I can give you. Repent. Seek me. If you like, what, what, what's the key to a successful life, to flourishing, human flourishing? Seek God and live. Let's pray together. Let me encourage you to bow your head and close your eyes. I'm going to ask Ronnie and the worship team to come up to the platform. I think it is super helpful if you've been with us for any length of time. I always challenge us to apply something we've seen, heard, or experienced. Now, it may be in the text. Maybe in a song we sung. Maybe in something you've heard where the Lord is pleading with you like he pleaded with Israel. Come back to me. So if you're a follower of God, through your faith in Jesus Christ... I want to encourage you to repent of yourself and sin, even if you woke up and you're like, I, I mean, like, I, I think I'm living in right relationship with God. Every day of our lives, we have to crucify our flesh, repent of it. And by the way, repentance, it gets a bad rap. It's a word that's full of hope. We need to redefine repentance. It means stop going the way of things that will destroy you. That's what a loving God will do. He'll, he'll tell us that. I praise God for his faithfulness to us in that way. And then he says, seek me. So let me encourage you to repent of sin and self. And there may be something very specifically you need to repent of. So if you're thinking about something, an idol you worship that needs to be killed or crucified in your life, maybe you tell the Lord, I need help with this. I, I, I don't need to worship this any longer. You need to be in a group with other people in the church, a life group, a Bible reading group, a mentor relationship where people can help you seek God and put to death those things that are false idols. So you may need to do that today after the service is over. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, from birth we are at odds with God. We are sinners and we deserve God's wrath. I tell you that because I love you. Christians don't have it all figured out but we have been forgiven. We've been given the righteousness of Christ and we have eternal life to begin again, to put one step in front of the other and find purpose and hope. If that's what you desire today, there may be somebody in the room or somebody watching the stream that needs to repent of sin, turn from themselves and trust Jesus for the first time ever. I'm gonna strongly encourage you, don't leave here today without giving your life to Jesus Christ if that's what you need to do. But let me give you a couple of minutes where Holly's playing softly on the keys. I'm not talking over you, but you can respond. And in this moment, make commitments to the Lord that he's leading you to do. stand with us as we sing this song before we leave today. Your breath.
Well, real quickly, two things. First of all, I met some of you that are first-time guests, and we're so grateful that you're here this morning. Listen, if you're not connected, one of the best ways to figure out what a church is about is to dust for God's fingerprints. Where's he at work here? Who can I get to know? So listen, take a next step. Let me know after the service. Let one of our ministers or our interns at the discipleship desk there in the commons area know that you're, you're just looking to get connected. Let us know how to help you with that. But we, we thank you for carving out an hour to be with us this morning. In just a couple of weeks, our college students will be returning. There's about six or seven universities that attend here. We're thrilled about that. Many of us, we've been traveling for the first time in like 16 or 18 months. And so many people are out on the road this summer, but like we'll be bringing in more chairs, like it'll be filling back up as people come back. And so we also want you to find your place of service. We need people to join us in the mission of God. We're excited about what's coming in the future. And during August, I'll be sharing that, but like, Plug in, help us, serve, find a place of joy in your service. Um, they're going to hate me for doing this, but Dalton and Reggie Friendsley are right over here. I see them. Um, Dalton's staring at the ground and trying to crawl under his chair right now. But Dalton and Reggie have moved to North Carolina in the last couple of years, but they helped us plant this church in 2014. We would not be the church that we are without people like you helping us. Dalton was the chairman of our deacons. Um, you guys are servants. You remind me of Christ when I see you. I'm forever grateful for you. Thank you. So glad that you guys could visit with us. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Before Ronnie sings the doxology, let me read this, and this is, this is our prayer this week, verses 14 and 15. I pray that we would continue to become and always be this kind of church. Lord, help us do this. Pursue good and hate evil so that you may live, and the Lord, the God of armies, will be with you. Lord Jesus, please make it so. Hate evil and love good. Establish justice in the gates of your city. And perhaps the Lord, the God of armies, will be gracious to you, my people. That's our prayer for us. Let's be that kind of church, okay? God helping us. Let us know if you need anything. Ronnie, would you lead us? Let's sing this. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Amen. You guys have a great week. Thank you so much for being with us.